I'm very excited about hearing about this topic. Uh, and the topic is what men need to know about marriage in the first year of recovery. So I'm going to mute everybody but Michelle. And uh, Michelle, over to you. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, again, I'm so encouraged to see you all here. And I'm honored to be a part of it. I um, have so much of my heart um, in the work of helping men uh, recover from sexual addiction and also supporting their spouses. Uh, right now, my practice is probably about 75% men and uh, recovering from sexual addiction and the other 25% of partners. And um, so it's really um, interesting and helpful for me to gain both perspectives. So along with the research and the training, actually sitting with these individuals and seeing how differently they walk through this process is very eye-opening. And so when I get to have the chance to see both perspectives and then bring it into a couple situation, it's even better. So uh, I really appreciate you all being here. Um, I am um, just going to update you guys about two things that I'm doing. Um, the first being, uh, there is a book called, a workbook called Help Her Heal for Men, and it's to help their partners um, recover from the betrayal and it's an empathy workbook and so empathy is one of the things that I hear time and time again that I thought I would always had empathy I'm a nice person I'm a good person but yet when my wife is crying or sad or her anger is evoked I show up with uh, I'm either cold or distant or defensive and so this idea that they're able to be empathetic to other people but they have a really difficult time having empathy for their spouses or they've realized that they really don't have a good knowledge of what empathy is and they're not able to express it. And so this workbook is so helpful because it helps understand what empathy is and how it's going to help the healing process. And I did a, a small group for men a while ago on walking through that book and we did it all together. And I'm gonna be starting that book, uh, that uh, a group again, hopefully in the late summer, early fall. And so if you're interested in, in going through that workbook uh, please go to my website and email me. Um, additionally, I'm training uh, right now with Jay Stringer and I'm doing the unwanted course with him. I'm one of six therapists that are training um, about how to be an unwanted guide. And so along with the sex addiction uh, uh, research and certification, I am so in love with the book Unwanted and feel like it really ties in the family systems and attachment theory along with sex addiction theory. And so I do and would love to start a, a group on going through the Unwanted series. I foresee that being a very small group because this is such an intimate book. And I'll probably will have a, a couple of groups going on throughout the year. Uh, and so I'm starting my list right now with people that are interested. And so if you are interested, again, please go to my website and reach out to me and I will add you to the list. Okay. Um, so today is about what to expect the first year. And for many people, they come into my office when there was a discovery five or six years ago, and then there was another one and another one, and now they're fresh on the heels of a brand new discovery. And so when I say the first year, what I mean is at any point where there's been a discovery or a disclosure, and as Jay said, a grenade has just come into your life and everything has exploded, we are treating that as day one. And even if you are six months into your day one, let today be your day one. Let today be the day that you do things differently with your partner. Um, and so my job as a therapist and as um, someone that was so wanting to help individuals is I do not want to evoke any shame. And I have so much compassion and empathy for the men walking through this because I know so deeply that sexual addiction is rooted in trauma, early childhood adverse experiences, and that, as, um, as someone mentioned, that um, this is a, not a flaw, but a wound, and that wounds can be healed. And uh, that is just such a perfect example of the work that we do. But as we get, begin to talk about helping our partners walk through this, um, many times the shame will be evoked. Um, it's almost like you've punched your wife in the face, and now you have to go give her a hug and try to help her um, feel better after you've hit her. It's very counterintuitive. So see her crying or you see her upset or not sleeping, many times our shame, our guilt is going to pre prevent us from actually showing up and being there for her. Um, and that is one thing time and time again that partners will say to me, I wish he could just be there with me. I don't need him to do anything. I don't need him to say anything. I just wish he could acknowledge it, put his hand on me, ask me what I need, ask me if I want to talk about it, and that he could just listen. 
I don't need him to make it better. I don't need him to fix it. There's no fixing it. I just want him to be there with me. And uh, Brene Brown talks about empathy. And that is one thing that she says is empathy is feeling with people. And it's so hard when we've not actually felt what they're, they felt. And so we're trying to access emotions in us that maybe we've never felt before, or it's been a very, very long time. And so it's not about knowing exactly how they feel. It's just about being willing to sit there with them and be there with them in that emotion. It's huge. It's so healing. Um, and so in the book, Help Her Heal, the workbook I was referencing a couple of minutes ago, chapter one and two are all about your feelings, because in order to understand her feelings, you have to understand your feelings. And so a big part of my practice is to begin to have an emotional intelligence, begin to identify emotions, realizing that our triggers are surrounded by emotions, our addictions are surrounded by emotions. And so learning to be uncomfortable with emotions, learning to understand what emotions you're feeling, because in order for us to be able to have empathy for her emotions, we have to understand our own. Um, and many of the people I work with have been emotionally shut down for a very long time. And uh, they learned to do that in early childhood as survival or coping techniques. Uh, they had it modeled by parents um, or they were bullied or shamed or they were too sensitive or men shouldn't feel, men can't cry. And so the cultural did that to us as well or did it to y'all as well. And so right now we're trying to bring emotions back online and that's gonna help your partner heal. And so um, I'm going to use uh, the term um, affair in um, the communication today. And so what I mean by that, either affair, affair recovery, is whether it is pornography, messaging women online, an actual sexual affair, um, an emotional affair, um, that that in a partner's eyes is considered infidelity. And so we will be using the term affair for that. So whether it's online or in person, it's still considered to partners as an affair, as an infidelity. And so um, I don't know if I mentioned this on the last uh, meeting, but I'm going to go ahead and repeat it. The woman brain and the men's brain, they are so different on how they handle this. Um, most of the guys I work with are able to compartmentalize this, or at least they think they, they can, that it's, it's showing up. It's showing up in how um, shut down they are, how depressed they are, how um, avoidant they are of certain things, but they are, find it quite easy um, to kind of take, a, take something that's happened and just kind of shove it away and just leave it there and then go on to something else. Whereas women, our brains are everywhere. So if we can be washing the dishes and thinking about what we're doing for vacation in a year, what happened five minutes ago, what we need to do next. And so women are multitaskers and so our brains are gonna work that way, which is my, why you might see your spouse going from, I'm in a really, really good mood right now to all of a sudden something happens and I am very, very distraught and emotional and I could go from anger to happiness quite quickly. Um, so the man's brain is like a waffle. If you pour syrup on it, it goes into all the little holes and it kind of stays there. Where women is like a pancake. You pour that syrup on the pancake and it goes everywhere. And so just an idea of how to think about how differently your partners are going to see this uh, than you are. Jay mentioned that he had this idea that it was just going to be a, I forgive you. Let's put it, let's just move it away. Let's start fresh. Let's just move on. And um, I have seen that happen. But what I know is that doesn't stay that way. If we just choose to move on and not deal with it, it's going to come back up. It's never going to be healed. And so my advice to you and my encouragement to you is to walk through it. It is so painful. It is so difficult to feel what you're going to feel, to feel what your partner is going to feel, to see her, to experience her anger, her disgust, the cruelty that she feels from you. But I promise you, in order to heal it, we have to walk through it. And that's the same with your own healing. In order to heal sexual addiction, you have to walk through it. You have to look at the early childhood. You have to look through the pain that you experienced. You have to understand the family dynamics. You have to separate honor from honesty. So uh, that being said, the first year is the most difficult. You are going to experience every feeling on the feelings wheel, as is your partner. There are going to be days that seem optimistic, followed with days that seem hopeless. This is really normal, so don't give up. You'll wonder if it's worth it. Is this difficulty of restoration, is this difficulty of argument and conflict, is it worth it? Should I just leave, divorce her? It, I think it's going to cause her less pain. I don't want to do any more harm. So maybe if I'd leave her, it will be better. Maybe if she just divorces me, it will be better. But I promise you, the couples that can walk through this and do the work that needs to repair 
they are, I am somewhat envious of what they have because they are an intimately connected and they each see each other. They see the shame, they see the hurt, they see the sorrow, they see the beauty, and they still see each other through it. And so the level of intimacy that these couples have, um, I don't think couples that haven't walked through this walk could ever have anything close to that. So I encourage you that the other side of this is full of hope. Um, so you're going to see you, yourself vacillate between shame and frustration, shame and shutdown, um, hopefulness, hopelessness. And so your emotions are going to be all over the place as well. You're going to vacillate between empathy and resentment. Um, and you're going to also feel both humble and selfish. And so as you walk through this, your emotions will never be consistent as well. Um, you are going to experience both the worst and the best of your partner as she will experience the worst and the best of you. But remember that conflict builds intimacy. Conflict is understanding someone's perspective, not necessarily agreeing with it or taking it as your perspective, but I am understanding your perspective and where you're coming from. The process of affair recover, recovery is going to be the biggest conflict you've probably ever experienced, which means that the deepest level of intimacy is going to be possible. So take a sip. <clears throat> As I mentioned last week, I had a, or two weeks ago, there was a very large emphasis on telling the truth. But I also wanna give caution to disclosure. Um, I have um, had couples show up who uh, the man or the woman who was the one who had the infidelity just disclosed everything. And the, what they disclosed and how they disclosed it included details that were highly sensitive and highly traumatic. Um, they forgot certain things and then came back later and told them the partner. And so I am now dealing with a high, high level of trauma from them both. And the recovery from a couple like that is going to be a, a lot greater because we now have to work through the additional trauma, the additional details, those images that she's never going to get out of her head. And so if you are preparing to disclose something or want to disclose, I really encourage you to work with a therapist or a sponsor or someone that's highly trained and has gone through this before in order to walk through the process to not cause more harm than needed. Um, it can save the betrayed partner um, a, a really a lot of pain. And it's also great if your partner is in with a therapist as well. Um, so when it comes to telling the truth, again, uh, the small lies are huge, as I said. Uh, I see lying as something that is uh, almost as difficult to stop as the addiction itself. I have a three-year-old and he started to lie a couple of months ago. And so most of us start lying at two, three years old. And so if we think about how, long, how old we are now and how long ago three years old was, it's a very, very long time. And so lying for some of us is just ingrained and it's a first response. Um, so some other things you're going to experience in the first year is a push and a pull from your spouse. So in the beginning after discovery or disclosure, there tends to be an increase in sexuality between uh, the husband and the wife. Uh, the spouse is both highly eroticized, uh, but also very much in trauma. And so she's having a response of kind of clinging to her partner for safety. Um, there, this is a very biological response that she's having. Um, she is both threatened and scared and both also seeing a lot of truth and honesty and most likely a different side of the partner coming out that she's either never seen, always knew was there, or hasn't seen for a long time. And so this idea that your transparency, you showing these emotions, you telling her the truth is both hurting her, but also very much giving her what she needs, this kind of emotional side of you. And so I have partners come in and tell me, I can't, I don't, can't stop having sex with him. I, I don't know why I'm so angry, but I'm so also aroused. And so I really try to validate that that is very normal. And so that can be really confusing for you because one day she's very much into you and wants you. And then maybe just a couple minutes later, a couple hours later, a day later, she's very, very angry. And so she's going to both push you away and pull you closer, push you away and pull you closer. Um, and so very normal. Don't get just. And it's not going on. And so many times partners will go into this highly traumatized trigger state where there's a lot of sexuality and intimacy um, or what feels like intimacy. And then they kind of continue to walk through that grief process and they will begin to shut down shortly after this because they will begin to go into the 
anger, the sadness, the depression. And so um, this is, as we walk through grief, if someone passes away, your spouses are gonna be walking through their grieving process. Um, so your spouse is also going to be very hypervigilant with you. Um, she's going to uh, hear things that you say or hear tones that you say certain things in and it's either going to evoke fear or um, suspicion. And so your words, you're gonna at times feel like you're walking on eggshells because everything you say is either going to be the wrong thing or she's going to think too much into it or she's going to be triggered by what you say and correlate it to an experience of pain. And so um, when we get married, we attach to our partners for safety and security and attachment. And so you are both her safety, but now you're also the person that's hurt her. And that's very, very confusing for the female uh, because I both love and hate. I both am attracted and disgusted. And so that vacillation between these things is gonna be very frequent throughout the first year. Um, all right, uh, your partner will be triggered. Um, the tr a trigger is when the past invades the present. So triggers can be both easily predicted, but they can also sucker punch you out of nowhere. Um, I think it was in one of my men's groups, someone told the story of, he had a discovery one winter night a year ago and they were making chili. And they hadn't made chili since because it's a winter time meal. And that next year they made chili and the smell, the process triggered her. And they didn't put two and two together until they realized the night that she found out everything was the night that they had chili on. And so, again, some of these things are just so unpredictable. Um, if your phone has been a source of pornography for you in the past, when she sees your phone or sees you on your phone, she's going to assume that you're watching pornography. Um, if you stay up late to watch movies or play video games, and that's when you've actually been acting out, she's going to worry about you and be triggered if you're staying up late. Um, if you told her you were going to the grocery store, but yet you were visiting an escort, whenever you leave the house, she's probably going to be watching you on her phone trying to track you, or she's going to be highly triggered um, and uh, very much uh, worried and concerned and in fear when you leave. If your affair partner was a coworker, uh, sometimes you going to work is going to be very, very traumatic and stressful for her. And so these things are really normal. Um, and it's going to sometimes think that everything is triggering her and other times you're going to be able to very much predict it. Um, you'll also notice once you walk through this process that affairs and sexuality are everywhere in the media. They're in movies, TV shows. I never realized how normalized our TV culture and our movie culture makes having sex outside of a relationship or having multiple sexual partners. And so this idea that even just watching a movie and having to, trying to have a nice night on a Friday evening after work could possibly send her into a trigger. Um, and so uh, just be mindful that your shame will most likely be evoked during this time. Um, but working through your shame in order to show up for her emotionally is exactly what she needs. Asking her when she's not triggered you know, I want to be able to be there for you when you are triggered, but I just don't know what to do. I don't know if you want me to hug you, leave you alone, come closer, stay away. And she might not know either, but just the fact that you're thinking of this is going to show her that he cares, that he's trying, that he might be really confused, but he's trying. Um, and so in moments of triggers, spouses might need space, time, hugs, reassurance, validation, empathy, a listening ear. Um, they might need to just spew out anger. And I, I don't encourage this all the time, but it's very, very normal for a while, especially when they're going through the anger phase of grief, that they are very much being almost verbally abusive to you. And so I really try to work with my partners on trying to regulate that anger and pain or that they find a support group to work through it. Um, you can also have boundaries about what you're willing and, and not willing to hear or setting times that are going to be more appropriate for these conversations. But uh, when I speak to how you should show up for a partner, I'm not asking you to be there and just be someone that she's throwing daggers at or, you know, kind of riddling with bullets on a daily basis. But it is common for, especially in the very beginning, for her pain to come out as sharp daggers that feel like they're cutting you deeply. And that does end uh, shortly after the anger period. 
But if you're showing up with defensiveness or coldness or uh, gaslighting her emotions, which is um, trying to make her think something that's actually different from her reality, um, because that's most likely what was happening at a, a, when you were acting out. And so if that's happening again when she's triggered, uh, she's going to be highly activated by that. So um, again, so when I talk about what you should do for your partner, um, there are some partners who are very much abusive when it comes to this, and I do not condone that. Um, but I am more talking about a, um, a relatively normal couple walking through this where there's going to be anger, but it's not consistent uh, throughout the entire process, if that makes sense. Um, so uh, neurologically speaking, um, the uh, trauma is going to be hardwired into her. So um, she is going to see something on TV or drive by an old hotel room or see you take your phone into the bathroom and she's automatically going to go back and revisit that pain again and it's something that she's not going to be able to control if she can get in with a support group or a counselor begin to kind of work on her betrayal trauma they're going to have different interventions that can help her ground herself during these things understanding her triggers just like your job is to understand your own triggers but when you show up for her with empathy and comfort and help her walk through this process with safety um, and security, her triggers will begin to go down in frequency and the comfort that you are giving her will begin to override the pain that's been caused. And so the triggers will shrink in intensity, frequency, and duration. Um, and you will see that as you work through the process. Um, so one of the biggest things that I can tell you is that communication is key for you during this process. Uh, to rebuild trust takes time, consistency, um, and a dedication to the process. So you are going to need to be able to understand your feelings, articulate your feelings, and express your feelings, while also expressing empathy, remorse, and forgiveness. She should be included on what you're doing in your recovery. She doesn't need to know every detail, but allowing her to see, this is what I'm doing. This is what I'm learning. These are the activities that I'm participating in. And she is going to be watching your actions and not so much your words. Um, learning how to communicate with your spouse after an affair um, is something that takes mutual responsibility. Um, both of you are going to learn how to uh, talk through this have to be respectful through this. And that, um, again, you are not necessarily the one who just is gonna be riddled with bullets this entire time, but your partner is also going to have to show up with a level of respect while walking through this process if there's going to be healing. And so um, this means uh, being able to regulate yourselves, uh, being able to understand if you're triggered and taking moments to breathe before having these difficult conversations or setting aside very particular times. I have clients that will do check-ins and this is one of those times that this can be done. Um, so if you are um, deciding to save your marriage, uh, you will have no other choice but to show up with transparency and honesty and consistency. Um, you will um, be very much um, required to have an idea of how she's feeling and communicating that to her. She's gonna wanna know what's going on inside of your head. She is going to for so long in this marriage, she's had no idea what you've been thinking or feeling or what's been going on. And so who she thought you were or who she thought the marriage was is no longer the truth. And so it is your job to provide her with that. And so this idea that you are willing to talk to her, you are willing to open up to her and not just about this, but just about life in general. Um, all right, so one of the hardest things that you're gonna have to do are answer questions. Um, and you are gonna be an agent of healing for her. And so again, um, asking a therapist to be involved or a professional if you're having a difficult time answering questions. Uh, she might ask the same questions 20, 30 times, but it's because her brain is trying to make sense of this. You've given her a puzzle and it feels like she only has 45 pieces of this 50 piece puzzle. And so she is just trying to gather every detail possible. So female brains are very much detail oriented. Um, and so if, uh, uh, if you can embrace empathy as your non-negotiable, you will find that this process will be much easier. Listening means actively listening um, to the pain that you've caused and how it's affecting your spouse's life. Um, to know that when she expresses her feelings, how she feels in this moment, not how she feels in general. And so sometimes what she says is going to be hurtful, 
but just remind yourself and ground yourself that it's how she's feeling right now. It's not how she's feeling in general. Um, and so apologizing is something that um, can be sometimes very genuine and sometimes just feels like I'm just saying a word in order to appease. And so an effective apology demonstrates that you understand the pain of the actions that you've caused. The best apology does not include any excuses um, or pointing blame at your spouse, even though the spouse might have contributed to the marital unhappiness. Um, and so if you're gonna be going forward, learning to share, listen, and learning to be heard. Um, your internal rage that you have is going to take a long time to diminish along with your spouses. Um, and so sometimes setting time per, throughout the week to talk about these things is better for couples and that's when a check-in can come in. Um, really be careful to not allow this to consume your life. Um, you all hopefully will be learning to discover each other in new ways. And so if this is a part of your life for the first entire year, every day, all day, it's going to be very exhausting. And so setting time parameters, especially as you get a little bit further into this process. Um, all right. Uh, so um, one thing that partners will also tell me is that they feel very lonely with their spouses throughout the first year of this that um, they feel like they're dealing with the burden and the pain um, of what's happened, but they're also dealing with the loneliness of having a spouse who is not able to emotionally connect with her, um, who's really busy with meetings and counseling and sponsors, and that has a whole bunch of stuff going on and a whole bunch of time away from the house and from the family. And now she's left kind of dealing with what's going on, what's happened, but also added responsibilities because she might be taking on more because you are so uh, really knee deep into your recovery. And so um, really bringing that and having empathy, empathy for that process. And so how can you contribute to her self-care during this process? If you are spending two or three days a week at meetings or several hours a day or hours a week on your recovery, how can you show up for her and have empathy for that process, what it's like for her and also contribute to her self-care? Um, and once, uh, once you guys are um, through the questions, once there's been a, severe, a, a period of sobriety, I really encourage you guys to start couples counseling. Um, before that, that prerequisite is of course, you having a really good understanding of the why behind the addiction, that you've worked through your process, you understand the drivers, you're not fully healed by any means, but you have a good idea about your experience, what led you here, what got you here, you are active in recovery, you are consistent, you're going to meetings, you're talking with other men, um, and you're being and following through with your promises and you're creating an, a, a man that has integrity. And once that is in place, starting with a, a therapist that's trained in the fair recovery um, is so important. And so you guys learning to navigate this new marriage together can be uh, very much um, increased with, uh, with empathy, understanding and connection through a really great couples therapist. So um, I could talk for hours about this, but I see we're at 1045, so I want to wrap up. But um, I have um, that book, uh, Worthy of Her Trust, um, Out of the Doghouse, a step-by-step -step guide for men caught cheating. Um, again, whether it's pornography or a physical affair, the books help her heal. Uh, there are so many great resources out there for you all to help better understand this. Um, and there are so many great resources out there for your partners. And so um, if you would like any of those resources, please feel free to give me an email and I will send them out to you. Any questions? Okay. Um